ask members to resume their seat, please. Order. We now move on to questions to the Minister for the Economy, and I call Daniel McCrossan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, question one, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the member uh, for his question? Um, I am wholly opposed to the Department for Education England's intention to impose a student number control on full time undergraduate English domiciles at Northern Ireland's higher education providers this uh, coming academic year. I am shocked and concerned that another jurisdiction within the United Kingdom is seeking to control student numbers here in Northern Ireland and the impact that this may have on our local sector. This intention runs contrary uh, to what had been agreed amongst the four UK administrations at the beginning of May in regards to a number of measures relating to admissions for the coming academic year under the UK admissions package. Local institutions will have already started to determine their recruitment of English domicile students without any indication that the Department for Education England restrictions would be imposed upon them. For this proposal to be brought to the fore at this stage in the recruitment and admissions cycle is not just unfair, but unprecedented. Five local institutions are impacted by the decisions. Queen's University Belfast, Ulster University, St Mary's University College, Belfast Metropolitan College and South Eastern Regional College. I have raised my opposition to the action directly with the Secretary of State for Education, Gavin Williamson, and the University's Minister, Michelle Donnellan. Based on legal advice, it appears that, I, that neither I nor the, my department can stop Department for Education England in reducing this measure. However, I continue to raise concerns of the local sector with uh, the University's Minister and seek a solution for any local institution negatively impacted by this decision. I call Daniel McCrossan for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the answer to that important question. Minister, can I ask, th th this year uh, in particular, the academic year has been hugely disrupted, or every way of life has been hugely uh, disrupted indeed. But for students, their academic year has been disrupted from start to finish. Minister, has there been any consideration given to the wavering of tuition fees for those students affected this year? Uh, and has your department of any engagements with the universities in relation to that? Because student debt uh, is a big issue, and I don't see why students should incur uh, that debt, given that they haven't benefited from the full opportunities of the educational opportunities that were there. Yeah. Um, can I thank uh, the member again for that uh, supplementary question? This is uh, a very, very important issue uh, for students. However, universities are autonomous financial bodies and therefore it is up to the universities to decide whether any return on the fee charged um, is something that they wish to pursue. In fairness to universities here in Northern Ireland, and unlike many universities uh, in GB and indeed in the Republic of Ireland, um, universities here in Ulster and Queen's um, and others have actually uh, allowed uh, students uh, to opt out of their um, contract uh, for um, accommodation, so therefore they have not been charged for the third term of that accommodation. Um, universities um, have also uh, been conducting a lot of online courses uh, and online uh, teaching, um, and we have ensured that uh, student uh, loans will be paid in the third semester in the same way that we have ensured that provisions for those in training programmes or uh, other similar programmes will also be paid. So, Universities of themselves have done a significant amount to try to alleviate student hardship and of course um, in the last monitoring round um, I was allocated uh, 1.4 million um, of COVID hardship fund which uh, with the reprioritization of resources in my own budget in the department I've been able to double that so an additional 2.8 million is going into uh, those student hardship funds uh, for the universities to administer because, of course, they know best the students that uh, attend their universities. Thank you. And I call Mark Durkin. Question number two. 
Minister, question number two. Yes, thank you. Um, can I thank the member um, for uh, his question? Um, COVID-19 has had a, a devastating impact uh, right across Northern Ireland, and it will, its impact will be felt in each uh, council district uh, across Northern Ireland. And I have not tried uh, to minimise that or to sugarcoat that position uh, in any shape or form. Um, my department recently published uh, the Charting a Course for the Economy document, a plan to restart our economy. And I'm pleased to say that some of the actions outlined in this document are underway, such as the much needed reopening of non-essential retail stores uh, on uh, the 12th of June. A key aspiration for promoting economic recovery and rebuilding the Northern Ireland economy will be the development of a competitive, regionally balanced, green economy with opportunities for all. Our longer term economic policy objectives will be reflected within a new economic strategy which will set out how we will seek to drive growth and prosperity for the benefit of all the people across Northern Ireland. And in that strategy, um, we will seek to continue to support those industries that are core uh, to our economy, those tourism, agri-food, manufacturing in industries. But we will also, within that strategy, seek to identify new opportunities uh, for growth uh, for the Northern Ireland economy in areas where we are already world class, in areas where we already are making a significant impact across the world, uh, and we will seek uh, to grab those opportunities for Northern Ireland. In particular, for um, uh, the North West uh, and for uh, the Council region there, um, I'm pleased uh, that we have uh, recently, as an executive, agreed uh, the new City Deal and the Inclusive Futures Fund, which will see over 200 million of investment in the city. And this will provide, in the medium term, a very important stimulus for economic and inclusive growth across the wider region. Uh, can I remind the Minister that there are two minutes for answers, and if she feels she needs additional money, time, she can request an additional minute at, at the start. I now call Mark Dorgan for supplementary. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer. The North West is the worst performing sub-regional economy on these islands, and I could ask a supplementary about the failure to expand the university. I could ask one about the, the tug of war currently ongoing with the medical school or invest in the record in the North West. But all of these are symptomatic of failed economic policy. The Minister talks of a new strategy. Strategy is one thing, policy is another. The last independent review of economic policy Can we have a took place in 2009. Will the Minister commit to a fresh, independent review of economic policy here? I am committed to an economic strategy that is for all of Northern Ireland and that is inclusive for all of Northern Ireland. An economic strategy that gives us balanced regional growth across the whole of Northern Ireland, but importantly, an economic strategy that actually captures all that we do best and grabs the opportunities for the future. And that is why I announced uh, the Economic Advisory Group. That is why I am this week um, talking to the group of stakeholders within uh, my uh, department, right across the full spectrum of the economy, about the important opportunities for the whole of Northern Ireland. Can I uh, just say that uh, in relation to uh, the very important uh, economic development opportunities that we have uh, in the North West, um, on the 22nd of May, uh, the local council submitted to my department uh, and the UK government the strategic outline cases for two innovation and two digital projects for approval. We are committed to assessing those and getting those back out because those will drive economic growth in the council area. Moving on, I call Sinead Ennis. Three, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I thank the member uh, for her question? My department fully appreciates the terrible impact 
the COVID-19 crisis is having on all citizens across Northern Ireland, especially the most vulnerable. We are engaging with other Northern Ireland departments to ensure that the Executive's priorities to support citizens and businesses are implemented as quickly and as effectively as possible. Our telecom on telecommunications matters, my department maintains regular contact with the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sports, who lead on telecoms policy, and with other key stakeholders, including Ofcom and industry bodies. As telecommunications policy is a reserved matter, DCMS is leading on a UK-wide basis regarding a cohesive package of support for the telecoms sector. The importance of connectivity has been underscored at this difficult time. The telecommunications industry, led by DCMS, have implemented a number of initiatives to ensure that customers, especially the vulnerable, can keep connected with work, family, friends and important services. I have met with the Mobile uh, UK to discuss how some of these measures are operating in Northern Ireland. This engagement is not directly related to the No One Left Behind Internet Access for All campaign. My department is aware of the letter issued by the participants and the Practice of Rights Group in April 2020, but has not been contacted directly. I believe that the telecommunications industry has worked with the cooperative spirit in responding to the needs of vulnerable customers during the COVID-19 crisis. Details of the various initiatives can be found on my department's website. I am also happy to write to the member around the initiatives, if that is at all helpful. Call Sinead Ennis for some. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her, for her detailed response there. Um, in 2019, the Connected Nations report showed that in the Newry Morning Down area, only 7% of premises had ultra-fast broadband, compared to that of 92% in Belfast. 9% um, of premises in Newry Morning Down weren't able to get even 10 megabits of broadband, and this is a serious issue for students and families and businesses, uh, not, with, uh, not uh, withstanding the, the the crisis that we, we find her in and the necessity to work uh, from home at this time. So can the Minister ensure that Project Stratum will prior prioritise areas with the lowest coverage? Um, can I thank uh, the member for a question? It is, uh, um, of course, uh, incredibly important. I am delighted that um, we are currently um, assessing the bids in relation to Project Stratum. Uh, the member will know that um, this arose from the confidence and supply arrangement um, and government uh, are continuing to fund this very important uh, infrastructure um, uh, improvement uh, within Northern Ireland. Um, I would hope that we would be in a position to award the contract for Project Stratum uh, in uh, late September uh, this year and that uh, we would see that um, we would have um, operations on site um, by late winter or early spring uh, of uh, the following year. It is absolutely and massively important um, to address the issue of poor broadband connectivity. And I think that the COVID crisis has actually made us more aware of how important it is um, for um, all areas of Northern Ireland uh, to be uh, connected. Um, and can I say that in, um, again, reiterating my theme of a regionally balanced, more competitive economy, I think that this is a really, really important infrastructure investment that this executive will make to ensure that we can achieve just that. I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, Deputy Speaker and question four, Minister. I thank the member um, for her question. Um, we are all understandably perturbed uh, by the job losses in our local constituency uh, in uh, Upper Bam uh, around the Thompson aeroceding uh, uh, industry. So officials from Invest Northern Ireland are in advanced discussions with Thompson aeroceding. They have met recently to agree the company's training and business plan and this has included discussions on skills and capabilities required for Thompson to implement its recovery plan and meet market demands. 
My careers department has also been in touch to offer the company assistance in the form of tailored careers advice to those workers facing uh, redundancy. And we all recognise that this is an incredibly difficult uh, situation uh, and one uh, where many people face an uncertain financial future. Call Dolores Kelly for uh, Thank you, Minister. Um, Minister, it, it is good to hear that uh, your officials are working with the company to, uh, uh, to uh, allow for sustainability of the company and its long-term future. But for those 500 people who have lost their jobs, I think there is an imperative to help get them placed urgently within uh, either retraining schemes and uh, jobs available in the area. So I wonder how that's being matched up, what specific action, and whether or not you would consider any additional funding to go, to example, for the Southern Regional College or elsewhere to actually provide uh, the classes and training schemes for those individuals? Um, the member makes a really, really important point. For those individuals that will face redundancy in the near future, it's important that we are able to offer uh, retraining, if that is necessary, or uh, further job opportunities. And that is why um, all branches of my department will be working with those employees, uh, whether that is with a uh, dedicated jobs fair, with further careers advice, uh, and indeed for our local um, further education college uh, to be able to offer the appropriate reskilling uh, and upskilling courses that are very important. And I think it's worthwhile um, just absolutely noting as well at this juncture. Um, I spent most of the morning this morning talking about um, skills in Northern Ireland and how to recover the local economy and protect it into the future by building the skills of our people, which is probably our, our greatest resource. Um, and I intend to bring forward uh, a package of measures for the executive to look at about how, uh, as part of our recovery, we will invest and build in skills. Crucial to that recovery will be that skills gap that is particular um, and can be um, dealt with particularly by our further education colleges. And I'm really looking forward uh, to bringing that forward and to working with our, our further education colleges to ensure that we address the skills gap. And whether that is about apprentices, about making sure that we have uh, a recovery programme for apprentices who may have lost their job, whether in Thompson's or within that wider uh, manufacturing supply chain, I think that these are really important issues that we now need to get working on um, for our uh, short and medium term recovery. Moving on, I call Linda Dillon. Ever a Kugel at the Hall, question five. The issue of youth unemployment is a particularly concerning issue at this time and one that stretches across several departments, not least uh, the Department for, the, for Communities as, as well as Economy. A key response to youth unemployment is encouraging employment opportunities and a priority for my department is the promotion and support for the apprenticeship system which plays a key role in creating an effective and sustainable pipeline for skills development in the Northern Ireland workforce, as is increasing participation in and awareness of apprenticeship training provision. Through my department's apprenticeship NI and higher level apprenticeship programmes, employers are encouraged to create apprenticeship opportunities which are open to all young people across a wide range of occupational areas. Colleges, universities and other work-based learning providers are funded by my department to deliver apprenticeship training from level 2 to level 7. For those aged 16 to 24, apprenticeship NI and higher level apprenticeship funding is available at all levels without restriction. For those apprentices who might lose their job or for young people unable to secure employment as an apprenticeship, my department provides a guarantee of a full-time training place through its Training for Success programme to all those under the age of 18. 
My department has also implemented a package of supplier relief measures related to the retention of services across apprenticeships NI, trainings for success and disability support provision as a result of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic to ensure the continued viability of our skills infrastructure. To support the rebuilding and renewal of the economy, my department is currently developing an apprenticeship recovery initiative with ongoing engagement with the UK Government and devolved administrations to explore additional measures to support existing apprenticeships and apprenticeship opportunities through both shutdown and recovery phases. These will, of course, require investment, and I will make an announcement on the additional support needs for these arrangements in due course. My department also provides an all-age career service with a particular focus on youth to, to both support them and seek employment, but also provide advice and guidance on the learning and progression options available to them. Can I again remind the Minister that there's two minutes allocated for answers, and if she feels that there's an important answer and she requires additional time, she can request it. Uh, I call Linda Dillon for supplementary. Thank the Minister for her response and, and the very detailed response that it was. Would you agree with me that not every young person wants to be a, an apprentice? Some would like to be an entrepreneur, and we have many who be encouraged to be entrepreneurs who are now in the very disadvantaged position because they have been given no financial assistance as newly self-employed or sole traders. Does the Minister have any plans to address that issue? Um, can I thank uh, the member uh, for her question? And you raise a really important point. Um, and one of the things that I would like to see um, us develop further is our thoughts on entrepreneurship and how we can develop that for young people in further education colleges uh, and indeed right throughout um, their education and training. I think that that is one of the things that's very viable uh, and possible for us to, uh, to introduce um, as, as a matter of great importance. In relation uh, to those young people who are entrepreneurial, who have started their own business, I do of course understand the very deep problems uh, that those young people have experienced um, over the last uh, number of months. Um, and of course, um, the, men, or the member will also be aware um, that uh, I have, uh, within my department, um, been uh, working through the various grant schemes that are available. Um, I will, uh, in due course, uh, be uh, making recommendations and uh, be making a paper available to the executive where they can decide where any underspend or further funding uh, might uh, go uh, to fit any particular group uh, that feels uh, that it has not uh, been supported in this situation. Moving on, I call Colin Gildernew. Uh, question number six. Can I thank the member uh, for his uh, question? I have no immediate plans to introduce new legislation in relation to agency workers. As Minister for the Economy, I would wish to work with executive colleagues and the Assembly to ensure that measures relating to employment rights balance workers' rights with the flexibility that Northern Ireland businesses need to succeed. The Agency Workers Regulation 2011 already entitle agency workers to the same basic employment rights as employees after a 12-week qualifying period. This includes statutory sick pay after completion of the 12-week service. In addition, recent legislation introduced in the context of COVID crisis by the Minister for Communities allows employees to receive statutory sick pay on the first day of illness rather than on the fourth. This is in line with EU and UK-wide legislation. Colin Kilden, you for supplementary. Thank you. And, uh, I, I do indeed welcome the fact that those agency workers get statutory sick pay and the uh, initiative taken by the Minister for Communities to improve their situation. But the Minister will be aware, like everyone in this House, of the key workers and the unprecedented commitment that they showed over the last period of time. Yet after 12 weeks, uh, those workers, agency workers still do not qualify for maternity pay for paternity pay, for layoff, or for redundancy. And I'm just wondering, does the minister um, believe that those workers are entitled to the same rights as every other worker? 
I, of course, uh, want to support uh, the member um, when he indicates of the absolutely sterling work that has been done in, across many sectors um, of uh, the community um, in, in Northern Ireland during um, the really difficult uh, time that we've experienced. I think that we can see that in food factories and in various uh, parts of the economy, uh, people have gone to work um, and um, have served their community uh, in making sure that essential supply and food chains uh, are available to us uh, in every situation. And that also includes those people who have worked in uh, small retail stores and indeed the larger ones um, uh, during a very, very difficult uh, time. I am, of course, committed uh, to employment rights um, that are, are um, sensible, that are uh, proportionate uh, and that are extended uh, to all. And I would encourage uh, anyone who believes that, whether they're an agency worker or otherwise, who believes that their employment uh, rights have been breached in any way during this difficult time, uh, that they can uh, use the Labour Relations Agency Workplace Information Service for impartial information on employment rights. And in addition, the Law Centre NI provides free, independent, specialist legal advice uh, on employment rights. Uh, and I think that those are important avenues that people uh, should use should they feel that their rights have not been respected during this period. Moving on, I call Martina Anderson. I'm the last can call you and can I take this opportunity to congratulate the Minister. It's the first chance I have had to do so on your position. Uh, case to ever shock. Question number seven. Can I thank the member? Um, it uh, seems a long time since uh, the European Parliament and the end of January. Um, and, and it's only a few months ago and a lot has happened. Um, but I want to say thank you. Um, I recently published my framework for rebuilding the economy into a more competitive, inclusive and greener economy which benefits all parts of Northern Ireland. This focuses on delivering higher paying jobs, a highly skilled workforce and a more regionally balanced economy. As such, addressing regional imbalance is integrated into all the work of my department. For example, to address regional imbalance in broadband access, Project Stratum will bring broadband services for those premises currently unable to access such services. Delivering benefits for all of Northern Ireland is also integrated into the work of Invest NI. Invest NI is actively working apologies, with uh, Derry City and Strabane District Council and regional partners to develop a coordinated approach to the development and growth of the regional economy in the FOIL constituency. Skills will also play a key role in our economic recovery and in the initiatives in this area will also help rebuild the economy of the FOIL constituency. I have been developing new initiatives to help sustain apprenticeships and support the pipeline of skills. Northwest Regional College has been doing impressive work in continuing to deliver courses. The college has worked quickly to move delivery to an online platform and has developed new courses in response to the pandemic. The college is also delivering a range of fully funded online courses. This will assist those who have become redundant or who wish to upskill or reskill to secure employment. Call Martina Anderson for supplementary. Um, going Margaret for, for that uh, answer. Minister, you've inherited a woeful record of Infest NI's um, lack of visits to Derry from the 2016-2019. I know you weren't in office, but I'm trying to understand maybe if you could try and outline how Infest NI overseas teams engages with prospective foreign invest, direct, uh, investors who would be coming to a city like Derry with all that it has to offer, how does it market it with the talent and skills that it has, and if you're going to do that in the context of tackling regional disparities in the time ahead. Um, can I uh, again uh, thank the member um, for uh, her question. Um, over the last five years, for which figures are available, Invest NI has offered 
81 million of assistance is to local businesses located in uh, the northwest. Um, and that is uh, the northwest uh, being defined as Invest NI's regional area office, which covers Cosway, Coast and Glens, and the Derry City and uh, Strabane Council area. This assistance will have delivered £439 million and support the creation of 4,280 jobs across the region. I understand that Invest NI plan to publish their latest figures uh, for 2019-2020 uh, uh, um, in uh, the reasonably near future. As I have said, um, my, the economic strategy that will be central not just to the recovery from COVID, but to uh, Northern Ireland's future uh, and indeed into its second century, uh, will be around producing a, a, an economy that has greater skills, a more regionally balanced economy, a greener economy, an economy that looks to grab the opportunities of the future, that uh, we will invest uh, and indent, uh, the, the core of our economy, our manufacturing, our agri-food, our tourism sector, but that we will also look to where the new job opportunities are, uh, where we can create uh, those new opportunities. Um, and central to that, of course, will be the work uh, of the, the city deals. And I've already been uh, to McGee uh, University and I've been extremely impressed uh, by that forward-looking approach uh, to those areas of the economy which will bring more and better skilled jobs and investment uh, for the future. Thank you. I call at last. Can call you question number eight, please? Thanks. Um, to date, I have had no engagement with the stakeholders uh, on the issue of sectoral bargaining in the childcare sector, nor is my department aware of any request from stakeholders to discuss this matter. However, I note that this is an issue that has implications for the Minister of Education and Health in their respective responsibilities for childcare in Northern Ireland. I, of course, am always open to working with executive colleagues, the Assembly and stakeholders to ensure that the wider plans that I have for ensuring our employment legislation framework takes account of the needs of workers and businesses in these very difficult times. I call Orlea Flynn for supplementary. Uh, and I, thanks, I thank the Minister for her response. Um, the Minister will be aware of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions report on childcare, which was published last year and found that workers in this sector are underpaid, with almost half being paid below the, the, um, the real living wage. Uh, the introduction of sectoral bargaining would help to set minimum standards of pay and conditions to devise career paths for workers in this sector, which has been historically categorised as a low-wage in industry. And I would just like to ask the Minister, um, will, will she ask the Labour Relations Agency to convene a sectoral bargaining forum between childcare providers and trade unions? Thanks. Um, can I uh, thank uh, the member for a question, of course. Um, for me to do that would require for the stakeholders to actually say that this is something that they of necessity want uh, to have. Can I call Michelle McElveen? Number nine, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank uh, the member for a question. Um, the fourth round of negotiations concluded at the beginning of this month. Whilst it is clear that the UK and the EU share similar objectives in many areas, Progress will need to be made on governance and on issues relating to open and fair competition. As negotiations proceed, the Executive continues to press the UK Government to do all that is possible to facilitate our trade within the United Kingdom with the European Union, including the Republic of Ireland. A positive outcome to the negotiations will be particularly important for cementing our trade within uh, the UK on goods and our trade on services with uh, the EU and for electricity trading. I believe that a deal is achievable, uh, but we clearly have some way to go in this no those negotiations, which will no doubt intensify in the coming months. I call Michelle McElveen for supplementary. 
I thank the Minister for response. Her Majesty's Government is carrying out a consultation on free ports. And while it may not be for her to respond to, could I ask the Minister what consideration her department is giving to this and the associated benefits and potential opportunities there are for Northern Ireland? Um, can I uh, again thank the member for a question? Um, it is, of course, uh, really important that we respond uh, to uh, our national government in relation to the free ports issue. Um, we need to understand the economic benefit uh, for Northern Ireland um, and how uh, that will actually benefit all of the people of Northern Ireland and all of the regions of Northern Ireland. Um, I am committed. Uh, to exploring any and all options to ensure um, that we have the policy tools to drive the Northern Ireland economy forward. And that is uh, hugely important at a time when we are recovering um, from uh, the pandemic emergency um, and uh, in a difficult space in trying to reopen our economy, revitalise our economy and ensure that for the future we are able to grab every opportunity that we can uh, to have a more inclusive uh, economy. <coughs> Pat Catney has just entered the chamber. Do you wish to ask the question? Well, maybe they'll, maybe they'll also clap when I give the answer. <laughs> I'm not terribly sure about that. <laughs> um, um, can I thank uh, the member for his question? Um, this is a really important issue um, and one that, uh, given the statements of today uh, from uh, our national parliament, is incredibly important uh, to Northern Ireland and to the recovery of this particular sector. The work of the Tourism Recovery Steering Group and its supporting working group is ongoing and a number of key issues are being progressed by my department in partnership with the industry and other stakeholders. A key focus uh, in recent weeks has been our work with the tourism and hospitality industry to identify a clear roadmap and timescales for the safe reopening of the industry. This partnership approach has been crucial in informing the executive's decision to begin the reopening of key sectors of the tourism and hospitality industry. I am delighted that depending on the rate of infection, caravan parks, camping sites and self-catering tourist accommodation will be able to reopen on the 26th of June, with hotels and other tourist accommodation being able to reopen on the 3rd of July. The executive's decision to allow visitor attractions, restaurants, cafes and coffee shops to reopen from the 3rd of July is also an important step forward, as is enabling the reopening of pubs and bars for the provision of food and the conditional opening of beer gardens. The steering group and the working group are also progressing work in key areas such as the development of overarching guidance to the visitor economy on how businesses can operate as safely as possible once lockdown is eased research and consumer sentiment to inform the industry and marketing plans, including uh, plans for marketing uh, in uh, our own domestic market in Great Britain and in the Republic of Ireland. I call Pat Catney for supplementary. Thanks very much, Minister. And I um, suppose what I really want to is I'm aware from your previous answers to me about the advisory group that's been set up to look at the gaps in the COVID response funding. Uh, even our hospitality and tourism sectors contains a vast proportion of single-person businesses. How close are we to finding support for them? Can I thank uh, the member for his question? Um, as I indicated at, in, <coughs> excuse me, in response to an earlier question, um, I, uh, of course, uh, am bringing a paper to the executive. It will be for the executive to decide uh, what is done with the um, underspend that is, has been uh, there as a result of the um, plans or the, the grant funding that we have had. Um, and uh, we will know the outcome of that process in the reasonably near future. These are important um, conversations. Uh, and the executive will make a balanced ju judgment on all of the competing um, issues uh, around that. However, can I say in general 
that the greatest and biggest help that we can give uh, to our tourism and hospitality sector is to allow it to reopen safely uh, and uh, in a way that makes it uh, financially uh, viable. I notice uh, that uh, in our national parliament, the Prime Minister has indicated that in England, he would like that um, social distancing um, measurement uh, to go down to one meter plus, um, uh, one meter being uh, the minimum uh, um, amount of distance. I have made no secret uh, of uh, advocating on behalf of the industry um, and saying that at one meter, um, our restaurants, our hotels, um, our coffee shops are more viable uh, than at the two metre social distance. And just uh, after the announcement made uh, by um, our Prime Minister this morning, um, I wrote to my executive colleagues and indicated that we too should formally rev review um, that uh, social distancing advice um, because we want um, our hospitality and tourism industry to be uh, sustained and be sustainable into the future. Um, and we need to make sure that the provision is there for them to do that. In a way, of course, that is safe with all of the reasonable mitigation measures in place. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you. Question 11. Um, it is crucial that uh, we move as quickly and safely as possible from the devastation wrought on our economy by the pandemic and that the executive works collaboratively to end this. The provision of childcare for those returning to work is one of the key supporting measures for restarting the economy. And I am working closely with executive colleagues and in particular the lead departments of health and education to align work and childcare. I call Rachel Woods for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister will be aware that we've still yet to experience the brunt of the negative impact of COVID-19 in terms of further business closures and redundancies to come that not only affect employers but the livelihoods of many. In light of this, uh, and the people who will be made redundant, what advice is the Minister or Department given to employers regarding engagement with trade unions to date? And will the Minister recommend that all employers across all sectors and regions of Northern Ireland have trade union representation, especially when decisions are being made that affect the future of employees? Um, of course, um, I would recommend that uh, there is full consultation on all or any redundancies uh, with uh, trade unions where that is applicable uh, in uh, which particular um, sector of the economy it's in. And I call Mike Nesbitt. Question 12. Um, the Northern Ireland uh, Executives Business Support Grant Schemes and the Micro Business Hardship Fund have now closed with over 300 million of support to businesses paid to date. Outstanding applications and payments are being verified and processed as quickly as possible. The Welsh Government's Economic Resilience Fund is still operational and therefore we do not have the necessary information to carry out a meaningful comparative analysis at this time. I have asked my officials to consider the outworking of the three support measures which have been managed by my department. Along with executive colleagues, I will continue to examine those areas of the economy which have been unable to avail of financial support to date and the investment needs of businesses as we move forward with attempts to reopen and rebuild our economy. I call Mike Nesbitt for supplementary. I thank the Minister. If, if the Minister was an entrepreneur struggling to survive this public health crisis, would she rather have access to Welsh loans or to, uh, Northern, sorry, to Welsh grants or Northern Ireland loans? Well, of course, um, my department has uh, made uh, significant amounts of money available uh, to businesses right across Northern Ireland. Um, that includes uh, almost 24,000 businesses run by very um, entrepreneurial um, people um, in uh, the Small Business um, Fund uh, for 10K um, and uh, in the 25K scheme uh, targeted at tourism, hospitality, uh, leisure um, and retail. 
We have also uh, looked at those businesses um, within uh, the micro uh, business fund. And of course, we will continue to look at other options that are available to uh, the Northern Ireland economy as we step forward, not just in grants that are about mitigating the impact of COVID-19, but as we bring forward those recovery measures that are really important to the vulnerable but viable businesses that we will need to help uh, and see through a difficult time uh, as uh, we go forward. Um, I have done some reprioritizing of my departmental budget in respect of this. Um, I have looked uh, at providing funds uh, for Invest NI and Intertrade Ireland around e-commerce. Um, we have looked um, at uh, how businesses uh, can uh, get online and what support that we can give to businesses uh, in relation uh, to those measures. Um, we will, of course, uh, be looking at a whole executive um, package um, and will uh, be speaking as an executive about this later on this week. And that is the end of our periods of questions to the Minister for the Economy and ask members to take their ease for a few moments.